Hi, this is Charles Hoskinson, and I'm making a very special, very unusual video today. I noticed a tweet from J.K. Rowling asking uh, for an explanation of Bitcoin. What is Bitcoin? What are cryptocurrencies? Uh, what's all this magic about? Um, I've been a big fan of J.K. Rowling for many years, and I had the great privilege of even seeing where she worked as a waitress, uh, oftentimes walking by it while I was in Edinburgh, uh, the Elephant Cafe. And uh, anytime there's someone prominent uh, or someone who's inspired so many people uh, asks for an explanation of what our industry is all about, I think uh, we in the industry have an obligation to give it our best shot to explain it to her. And so I invite all the other people in the cryptocurrency space who lead cryptocurrency companies, uh, please do make a video and talk about cryptocurrencies, talk about Bitcoin and try to explain what we're trying to accomplish as a movement. So you asked JK and I will present as best I can, as concise as I can, an explanation for Bitcoin. And I hope that this reaches you. I will tweet the video to you. If it doesn't, well, perhaps it'll be useful to somebody. And that's good. So let's start from the top. What is Bitcoin? And actually, this is how I got started in the cryptocurrency space. Uh, many people remember that I did a course years ago, over seven years ago, called Bitcoin or How I Learned to Stop Worrying and Love Crypto. And uh, the point of the course was basically to give an understanding of well, what is Bitcoin all about and why do we care? Uh, why are we bothering doing all this work, building all these things, writing all this code? Uh, and I started that course way back in the day uh, with the question, what is money? This is how we began, because the killer application of Bitcoin was really an exploration of money. And in general, money has three properties that we tend to care about. It's a means of exchange. So when you go to buy something, uh, if you were bartering, you'd have to have this phenomena called the dual coincidence of wants and needs. So you, if you're, for example, trading grain for, I don't know, a wood, uh, you'd have to somehow both parties would want to have each other's items. So the party with the wood would want uh, the other party's grain, and the party with the grain would want the other party's wood, and then they'd have to find uh, an e a ratio that they were both comfortable with. Money is a disintermediator. Uh, so if you have some middleman between that transaction, uh, then you can use that as a much more effective way of exchanging. Second, it's a unit of account. So you think of things like this is $25 or $30 or 100 pounds. Uh, these are meaningful units to the people who live within the culture that accepts that money. And finally, it's a store of value. So we don't really usually store our money in gold or land or other things. We certainly can, and many people do, uh, myself included. Uh, but uh, generally speaking, when we think about how rich someone is, like Bill Gates or Elon Musk, we tend to quote a dollar amount or a pounds amount. We say this person is works X million dollars or something like that. So these three properties together are fundamental properties of money. And there are a lot of other things to think about in the money story, like how easy is it to transport? How durable is the money? Uh, is it something called fungible? Uh, and fungible is just one of those silly little words for uh, you can't really distinguish between one unit of it and another. So, uh, for example, when you take out a pound sterling, if you have a, one of those coins, they should all look the same and you shouldn't differentiate one or the other. Whereas there are other things which are not fungible. For example, a priceless piece of art. There's only one Mona Lisa, so it's a non-fungible asset. So we tend to think about things like that. Fungibility, durability, uh, how easy is it to transport? How easy is it to divide? These types of things. Then when we move to kind of meta concepts. So we think, well, there's money, but then there's also this concept of debt and credit. So it's not just good enough to have something that you can use to buy stuff. So a means of exchange and you can measure the value in terms of that uh, and you can hold on to it and it holds its value. You'd also like to be able to convert that into loans uh, for future purchases because people who are poor, people in middle class, they just simply don't have enough money to buy a large purchase today, right now, like a house or a car. 
So they need to be able to convert that to something for the future. So there's a very strong relationship between credit and debt and money itself. So there's a big conversation of what makes good money. And this is something that is debated in every single economics program. This is something that's debated by every single central bank. And every now and then, no matter where you live, uh, you encounter this conversation of what makes good money. Uh, should your money, for example, hold its value pretty constantly over time? Or will your money lose value over time? Uh, or will your money gain value over time? So inflation or deflation, for example. Uh, is your money a pretty reliable unit of account where it's easy to price things inside of it? And furthermore, is your money making exchanges easy? Uh, so we tend to think of person-to-person -person exchanges. So those are personal exchanges. But what about online exchanges, for example? So if you're an online merchant, uh, what about cross-border settlement? So for example, you're buying something from England uh, if, on Etsy uh, from California, and they have to ship it to you. So this is a really interesting question of what makes good money, and there's a lot of opinions about what makes good money. So the Bitcoin experiment that was started in 2009, Bitcoin 2009, was basically saying, we're going to take a collection of ideas about a particular form of money, And what we're going to do is we're going to take those ideas and we're going to connect them to some cool technology. Okay. And in particular, you're going to see a lot of terms like proof of work, scary terms. You're going to see terms like blockchain. You're going to see terms like cryptography. Can't spell tonight, Rafi. There we go. <laughs> Having some trouble with that. That's okay. No mistakes. There's only happy little accidents. All right. So you're going to see a lot of these cool terms for technology that are a bit intimidating to beginners. And really what all these things have to do are putting you in charge. So in general, when you think about digital money, when you think about how do you translate cash into something that you can spend on the internet, generally speaking, you have a trusted third party, a bank or some form of exchange that will digitize and take a digital representation of that. So here's you, and I'm a terrible artist, I do apologize. And what you're going to do is you're going to put something into the bank, and then what happens is it creates a digital representation of that digital dollar. And then there's some form of network that all these other banks plug into. And that network will allow for you to send a wire transfer, to, let's say Bob, or maybe a PayPal payment, uh, or maybe some other means of exchange. Okay. But all of this is a very expensive middleman. And the point of things like proof of work and blockchain and crypto at the end of the day is to get rid of that middleman. So starting back at the top, money has these properties. It's a means of exchange. It's a unit of account. It's a store of value. It has some other properties like fungibility and divisibility and ease of transport and durability and so forth. And we'd like to be able to use it for financial products like credit. And we're right now asking, well, what makes good money? And Bitcoin is a particular philosophy on money. We'll get to that philosophy in a second. And it said, well, if we're going to do this and get this online, we need some cool technology. And what Satoshi did is invented some cool technology and then the goal of the, that cool technology is so that at the end of the day, Alice 
and have a direct relationship with Bob, just like you do with cash. So Alice wants to be able to send value to Bob. And the Bitcoin network, because it was the first of its kind, the only form of value can send is a Bitcoin. So a little bit of tokens that live on the Bitcoin network. And you can send that to Bob. So this was an experiment. And the point of the experiment was to see, could we get this mechanism here, the actual transfer of value to work? So could we construct a database, a ledger, that ledger is called a blockchain that stores all those transactions that occur. Can we have this little unit of account, this Bitcoin thing, will that actually be valuable? Will people actually pay money for it? And will this network get large enough that it's sustainable and stable And it's also capable of actually having people wanting to accept Bitcoins for products and services. And when I joined the space, the answer was no. It, it was very early days. Uh, we did not have a sustainable or stable network. There was a lot of volatility in uh, its, uh, its architecture. Uh, so there was people coming and going. The hash rate was very uh, uh, going up a lot, going down a lot. Uh, Bitcoins were basically worthless. Uh, you couldn't really get a lot of products and services in it. Uh, and uh, it was not clear if this model was actually going to be secure or uh, uh, going to last a long time. However, in just a few short years, the answer switched to yes. Bitcoin has grown to a global phenomena. Uh, that has not only stabilized to an extent that you actually can use Bitcoin as money, uh, but it's also grown to a point where it's launched an entire industry we call the blockchain industry. And the blockchain industry is basically saying, hey, all this cool technology that some anonymous person over the internet invented for an experiment, to be able to explore, can we create some sort of new type of money that has some cool properties about it? Could we abstract that technology and then apply that technology for all kinds of things like identity? For things like rights management. So for example, you are an author, you've written books that have sold at probably hundreds of millions of copies now, there's intellectual property there. How do you manage that in a better way? Things like property rights, registration of deeds and land. Things like remittances. Those are sending transactions from the developed world, development world, like from London to Addis Ababa in Ethiopia and doing this cheap. New forms of credit and financial products. And you can just continue the list on and on and on and on and on and on and on. And that's what we entrepreneurs in the blockchain industry do. And the basic concept here is that you have people who don't trust each other. And people can be businesses, governments, individuals, but need to. They need to trust each other for an industry to work. So, for example, uh, imagine the telecommunications business. You have a cell phone. I have a cell phone. Uh, if you travel, your cell phone goes from one cell phone network to another cell phone network, which is owned perhaps by a competitor of your incumbent cell phone network. So I'm willing to wager that competitors really aren't on the best of terms and they don't necessarily fully trust each other. But despite the fact that they don't trust each other, they need to work together for you, the customer, to be able to have a data plan no matter where you go. So that's an example of where blockchain technology works. Another example would be a voting system. So as a collective whole, we in a society need, if we're in a democratic society, 
to have faith in the credibility and structure and stability of our voting system, but there are political parties and political parties have a personal incentive to corrupt the voting system uh, for uh, them to get an advantage in the election. So the parties don't trust each other, but they need to work together uh, for their industry or endeavor to work together. Some of the biggest problems we have in the world, uh, whether those be climate change or this current pandemic, are great examples of where individually you have nations, people, corporations doing what's best for them, but they're not working together for the common good. Uh, so for example, the supply chains of medical equipment, uh, the movement of medical records, uh, who gets ventilators, who doesn't get ventilators. These are great examples of people who don't really want to work together, trust each other because they're representing their individual interests, but they need to if we ever want to make progress. So this topic of brokering trust and making sure that we can somehow find a way for a common good to form, but be decentralized, is kind of the crux of the blockchain industry. This is what we think about in this industry. How do we navigate trust? And how do we make sure that we can build solutions for people to work together without relying on centralized power? Much the same way that Bitcoin gets rid of these middlemen and it replaces it with a network that facilitates that same thing, you can get rid of conceivably any middleman, whether that middleman be the broker of property, of uh, voting rights, uh, of identity, uh, whatever have you. It's this concept of disintermediation. That's the key word for our industry, disintermediation. So in essence, what is Bitcoin? Bitcoin began as one thing, as an experiment. And almost all great things in life begin this way an experiment of passion and frustration. And the passion was, could we re-examine what makes good money and a good financial system? And the frustration was that the system that we have uh, right on the back of the 2008 financial crisis was not working so well. And so there has to be a fundamentally different way of doing things. Uh, so in essence, Bitcoin was just basically an attempt to do something different. Now, I mentioned what makes good money. What's the point of that? Well, good money is a hotly contested uh, thing amongst economists. You have different schools like modern monetary theory and Keynesian economics, neoclassical economics. Um, you have things like Austrian economics. Uh, and there are some people who think that uh, it doesn't really matter how much money is in circulation. They think who cares about inflation? Uh, you know, you can always just print more and somehow the economy will sustain it. There are other people that think only things that are connected to real life, things like gold, uh, can make good money because you can't trust government institutions. So Bitcoin chose kind of a neo-Austrian viewpoint in that it has a finite supply. And this is in stark contrast to uh, the policy of the Bank of England or the Federal Reserve System in the United States, the People's Bank of China. There will only ever be 21 million of these units, kind of like synthetic gold in a certain respect. There's only a finite amount of gold in the entire world. And once we mine it all, it's a mine. And so there will never be any more unless an asteroid hits the earth and gives us more we find a way to transmute it from uh, using you know, clever atomic physics or something, uh, there, we're not really going to get any more. So it says we're going to have a finite supply. So the value increases over time, given that the demand uh, continues to increase. This is in stark contrast to inflationary money, where the value tends to decrease over time. And this is the current system. Just in my own experience with the Bitcoin industry, I've witnessed uh, money go from, uh, Bitcoin go from uh, less than a dollar a token uh, to $20,000 a token. Uh, so it's been a pretty remarkable surge in less than 10 years, uh, and it's uh, only going to continue if 
people seem to think that the system is uh, valuable and produces utility for them. Uh, whereas, uh, in, I remember my grandfather, the first home that he purchased, he purchased for about $10,000. Uh, and uh, the last home that he purchased, uh, he purchased for $200,000. And the home that he bought for $10,000 was actually larger and on more land than the home that he bought for $200,000. So the dollar tends to lose its value over time. In fact, since the creation of the Federal Reserve System in the United States, the dollar has lost 98% of its buying power. And this is similar for the pound sterling in England. Uh, so basically Satoshi had some neo-Austrian economic ideas. He decided to create a finite supply of money uh, with the hope that the value would increase over time and the network would become stable and sustainable. Uh, he invented some cool stuff like proof of work and blockchain and used cryptography to make everything secure. And the fundamental concept is Get rid of the banks, get rid of the exchanges. Let's create a digital money that's like cash. So you directly pay it from person to person, like Alice to Bob. Here's Alice, and here's Bob. And the experiment was, will it work? Will people actually use it? Will it become valuable? Will it actually be something that people trade real money for? Will you be able to buy products and services? And currently there are hundreds of thousands of products and services. You can buy airline tickets and food and medicine and pretty much anything you want these days with it. And will it get large enough uh, that it's not gonna go away? And when I started, the answer was no. And to the benefit of all humanity, the answer is yes. Uh, but Bitcoin itself, as magical as it is and how much of an impact it's had, is not the end-all be-all. The reality is it launched an entire movement, an entire industry, and inspired millions of people throughout the world and billions of dollars of capital to begin looking at some of the hardest problems we're currently facing from identity to property to voting to remittances. And the goal here is to put you in charge, to put the individual in charge of their own identity. We call that self-sovereign identity to put you in charge of your own property, your own money, and ultimately for you to be your own bank. It's pretty magical when you think about it, um, this concept that we no longer need middlemen to be able to do business with each other, and we can do business with each other across an entire global spectrum. And what got me into the space and keeps me in this space is that we have a system where everybody is equal. We do a lot of work in Africa, and we do a lot of work in Eastern Europe and in Southeast Asia, and this concept that everybody is treated the same, regardless of where they come from or who they are, is something that's pretty magical, and it's never really been done before in human history. And what makes me most excited about this concept is that uh, once you've gotten this idea out there, it's really hard to go back. And that's why we have a movement of millions of people. People are starting to ask, if I have the ability to own my own money, my own bank, I have the ability to own my own property, uh, why would I ever want to go back to a system where somebody else takes that away from me? Especially when by doing so, I lose my privacy, I lose my autonomy, and in many cases, it's actually more expensive. And the consequence of everybody being equal is that the least amongst us have access to the same markets, the same infrastructure as the most amongst us. There's never been a time in human history where a way of governing things has been proposed that way. So this is kind of the underlying core philosophy. Uh, blockchain is the technology of trust and coordination in a decentralized way amongst people who don't trust each other. And that forms the heart of the system called Bitcoin. And Bitcoin was an experiment to see is there a better way of managing money and introducing different monetary concepts to people across the world uh, so that we could perhaps do things a little differently than the way that we've been doing things for a long time. Certainly a lot of controversy, certainly a lot of scandals, uh, certainly a lot of drama, uh, like all great things that spread across the world quickly. Uh, there's stories to tell, positive and negative, and uh, the story isn't over yet. There are many sequels coming. 
Uh, but that's the point of our industry. That's the point of Bitcoin. And in my view, it's probably one of the greatest inventions in human history. And it is really the uh, missing manual for liberty. Uh, it allows us to get sound money. It allows us to trust each other in new ways and ultimately allows the world to be just a little bit more peaceful. So thank you so much for your time. I hope that uh, this was uh, useful. And uh, thank you for the books that you've written and the inspiration you've given to so many millions of people around the world. And I hope my industry as a whole takes this as a call to action and uh, makes many videos with their own explanation and we could turn you into an advocate at some point. Take care, JK.